not supposed to be here. No. I'm not supposed to be here on this stage right now. I'm not supposed to be here on this stage talking. Uh, talking is the last thing I ever imagined myself doing in front of people. That's because I stutter. And over these many years, I've found ways to minimize my stutter, but it's still good. Sometimes it's wicked good. And as a way to kind of let you all know, about 5% of all children in the world stutter. But most of them grow out of it. By the time children become adults, there's less than 1% of the world's adult population that stutters. But those of us who do stutter have had to face an interesting life, an interesting life that we've had to fight, an interesting life that we had to fight to find some way to get past what it is that we are doing in life. We've had to face certain injustices in life. Immediately, when you see someone stutter, you start to think, wait a minute, they're nervous. No, they're more than just nervous, they're erratic. No, they're neurotic. Wait a minute. Why is this person kind of introverted? Oh, they're demure, they're shy, they're dumb. I cannot tell you how many times when I've stuttered, someone says, just slow down, take a breath, it'll be good. No, don't say that to me. Just let me be me. Or the times where they go, you know, we can't let John take a leadership role because, well, you know, he stutters. Or the point of, you know, hmm, because he's not too fluent in how he talks, he must be dumb. As a five-year-old child, I had a dot by my name in class. That dot by my name symbolizes that at some point during the week, John was to be taken out of class to go to speech therapy. But that dot kind of continued throughout my entire life in a certain way. Because when you get singled out for being special, perceptions start to happen. And then as I grew into my mid-twenties and so forth, that dot continued with me in life. Is that I had to fight to find my place to gain a rhythm so that I didn't have to live a compromised life, I could live a fulfilled life, despite the fact that I had a hard time stringing two words, three words, three sentences together. And by now, I'm 45. Just on Sunday, I was out playing tennis, and I was talking to some folks on the tennis court, and I was explaining what I do. And I said, I work at, brain's on fire. The person who was talking to did what those children did back in the day. They laughed at me. I cannot tell you how bad it feels to be laughed at at age 45. Because it takes me right back to being a five-year-old child. When I was five years old, being in school, I dealt with stuttering this way. I found out that it was better to have people laughing with me, not at me. So I became a bit of a class clown. Because I always knew that it was so much better, again, have folks laugh with me as opposed to at me. An interesting thing happened in high school, though, that, in a way, gave me this inkling as to what sort of life I was going to have to overcome. That's my twin sister. I'm going to introduce you to her. She's, she's Marty Moore. And while I had the dot in my name as, as a five-year-old child, she had a star up her name as a five-year-old child. She got put into all the advanced placement classes. I didn't. So in high school, I was, a, I was a junior, and she had taken this English class the year before. And so we kind of conspired a little bit here. We said, hey, let's test this out. So I took one of her English papers that she received an A plus on. I took that paper, and me being somewhat savvy and somewhat lazy, you know, I changed a few words, I changed the title for nearly the exact same assignment for the paper that I turned in that my honor student twin sister received an A plus for, I got a C minus for. I scratched my head going like, why? Why? How, how could this be? And it was at that moment that I realized that I was gonna have to fight to find success in life. And I ended up finding more of that fight when I got out of college. Because the unfortunate truth is this. When you have two equally qualified job candidates, the candidate who doesn't stutter is going to get the job. Trust me, I understand this. I interviewed countless and countless and countless times and was turned down countless and countless and countless times until it took one courageous person from Starbucks Coffee to hire me as a marketing specialist in 1995. And lo and behold, I give Lisa Denny Compton so much credit for having the courage 
the higher me, filled with passion, but not a lot of polish. But it also took something courageous for me. Because it was at that moment in time that self-acceptance happened for me. It was that point that I had a turning point in life. That I decided that stuttering was not going to manage me. I was going to manage my stuttering. And from that moment on, I began to use all the tips, tricks, and tools that I had learned for how to minimize my stutter so that I can communicate and put together two, three words and sentences together. And it was at that moment that my life changed. It was a huge turning point. And it was that day that I really decided I'm fighting this monster. I'm fighting this monster that I have to deal with. The injustices that I have had to face are going to no longer get me down. I'm going to go toe-to-toe, mano-a-mano, and hopefully one day I can be like Cassius Clay, standing over Sonny Liston, having defeated my monster. That day will hopefully will come. Not yet, but hopefully it will. Everyone in this room at a brand has the opportunity to fight a monster as well. Every cult brand is fighting a monster or monsters in this world. That is how they have been able to achieve greatness. That's how they have been able to gain an emotional connection with their customers and their employees. If you attended last year, you heard Peter Allen from Tim Hortons. In his presentation, he started to kind of talk about the monster that Tim Hortons faces. And he says that you, if you are aspiring to become a cult brand, you must be clear who your monster is. Because if you can identify what you're fighting against, you know what you're fighting for. For Tim Hortons, he said that, that the monster is living in a disconnected world. He said that Tim Hortons fights this injustice of us living in a world where we do not know our neighbors. And Tim Hortons, with coffee, coffee is the most amazing beverage in the world. Because coffee connects people with people and it connects the morning to the night. Every morning, most of us start our day with a cup of coffee, and it connects it at night when we finish it, the day off with a cup of coffee. But more importantly, it connects people with people. Think about how many important personal conversations you have had over a cup of coffee. Think about how many professional deals you have sealed over a cup of coffee. Coffee has unbelievable connective power to connect people with people. And as Tim Hortons that's out there wanting to make sure that they can fight against this injustice of us not knowing who our neighbors are. Cult brands can fight monsters. And so that's really what I want to zero in on in this conversation. And let's clearly identify what an injustice can be. So the monster that I'm talking about is an injustice that exists within the marketplace. It is a situation where the rights of a person or a group are ignored. In cult brands, they know this. They know that that injustice is there, and they know what they're fighting for and who they're fighting for. Because when you can identify the justice that you are fighting against, it can breed your brand's purpose. And when you have a purpose for why you exist, lo and behold, that creates the vision that allows you to put a roadmap out for how you are going to make a difference in people's lives. One cult brand that I admire immensely, Love 146. They are an organization, a nonprofit organization led by Rob Morris. And this is an outfit that is out there to abolish child sex slavery. This is a startling stat. Every minute, two children are sold into sex slavery. I'm going to let that just sit for a second. How can you even start to grasp that? But you can clearly see where this injustice conversation is going. Rob Morris's Love 146 is out to change this. But along the path of him wanting to change the world, his world got rocked. He received a cease and desist letter saying that the original name of his organization had already been trademarked. Children for Justice International. He had to change his name. And so Rob came to us at Brands on Fire a few years ago with this need for him wanting to become the cult brand that they have become today. So we sat Rob down and we asked Rob, 
Rob, tell us how you got in this room today. Tell us your story of how your company began. And so in the story of Rob telling us this story, he said that one time they, him, and some folks on the board of directors took a trip to Thailand. And this trip was so that they could pose as the predators that they so despise. And in this trip, they went to a brothel where these predators could choose a girl to have sex with. It took everything within their power not to be there with rage, wanting just to overturn everything, but they were there to soak it in. Rob tells us this, this story about how he's there, and he's peering through a door that has a tiny window. And when he's peering through this door, he's seen young girls with zero life in their eyes, nothing. Everyone in that room was basically dead. He also mentioned how in the corner of the room, there was an old television set, cartoons with snow all on the set. But Rob said he continued looking, he continued peering through, and lo and behold, he saw someone. He saw someone in that room that still had life in her eyes, that still had fight in her eyes. And as he told us the story, he says that he will never know this young girl's name, but he will always remember her number, 146. And when Rob told us that story, we went, stop, stop. That's unbelievable. But that's the name of your organization, Love 146. And at first, Rob kind of went, wait a minute, what kind of name is that? You know, how, how can I really use this name? Because what does that mean? And then he started to understand what it means. When now he gets on a plane and hands his card to someone that says, Love 146, what happens? A conversation is sparked. Oh, what do you do? And that gives Rob the chance to tell that story of the little girl that he saw. Previously, he gave out a card that said, Children Justice International. Okay, it didn't mean anything. So Love 146 is out there fighting this injustice that life is precious. That every young girl, every young child has the right to live the life that they're supposed to live. That's what they are fighting for. And they are indeed a cult brand. Rob also tells us the stories today about how he just gets unsolicited emails from people that are taking photos of the number 146 wherever they see it in everyday life. It could be on a highway where they see highway number 146. It could be a hotel room. It could be a, an apartment number. And that just helps to continue that story. But what they started to also do was they wanted to make sure that their advocates have the tools needed to make change happen. They have developed task, task forces. And they have over 400 active task forces around the world. Just last year, each of these task forces working independently of Love 146, Love for 146 only gives them the guidance and the tools. They develop their charitable programs on their own. They meet on their own without specific guidance coming from the overall charity. Just last year, they had over 200 events, raising money and raising awareness for the children's that are out there that are in the slave trade. This is one group, Dayton, Ohio, where they are very, very active, and they do a lot for this cause. But again, it's this brand giving up control, giving them, those advocates, the tools and the resources to make change happen. This is gonna be kind of a weird transition, but it's all right. Chuck D, who is the founder of the hip hop group Public Enemy, once said, before people can buy from you, they've got to buy into you. Chuck D and Public Enemy started back in the golden age of hip hop, mid 80s. At that time, there was a lot of ego rap and party rap. Chuck D went out there and says, you know what? There's a story to tell that is out there. There's a story to tell about what's really happening within the neighborhoods. And when he went out there with actually a true message, something that informs the public, Lo and behold, he stood for something. 
And I think this line here, before you can buy, before people can buy from you, they've got to buy into you, works so well for every brand in this room. It works for dogfish head beer. I love great beer. Dogfish, off-centered ales for off-centered people. That's their slogan, that's their mantra. They clearly know that they are different from a lot of other breweries. And yes, craft beer has exploded over the years. Sam Calagione, back in 1995, he took basically his homebrew set, built a restaurant around it, and a kitchen was so close by. What he would do was, he would brew beer and go into the kitchen and bring exotic ingredients and put it into the batch of beer that he was making. Lo and behold, he realized that he was doing things that people were not doing. And he realized, too, is that what they are out there to do is to explore the edges of what beer can be, pushing the creative boundaries. And they have laid the foundation so that so many other breweries out there are following suit and are brewing some creative beers. But for Sam, his injustice that he's fighting is that he believes that beer should be more about imagination and passion than process. I think you know exactly where I'm going. These mega brewers out there are unbelievably amazing at being proficient and consistent. They brew from process, not from the heart. And so Sam was out there starting that fight, and we all know that the craft beer scene again is different today than it was back in 1995. And thanks to Sam laying some of the foundation, there were so many great craft beer companies out there that are fighting the fight against bland beer. And when you take a look at the tail of the tape of who Dogfish is really, in a way, fighting against as far as the process of automation, it's the big boys. It's Anheuser-Busch InBev. And this tail of the tape says it a lot. Dogfish had been around about 21 years, Anheuser-Busch, 164 years. Worldwide distribution, in just last year, over 25 million hectoliters, and I can't tell you how many gallons are in a hectoliter because I'm from America and I don't understand the metric system. <laughs> Dogfish, less than 300,000 hectoliters. The style, Anheuser-Busch, it's mass appeal. Dogfish, it's niche appeal. It is the classic David versus Goliath story. And any time that you can pitch yourself against a, a Goliath, you have the opportunities to earn your right to potentially be a cult brand. Because it's so easy to fight the fight against the big guy. That is an easy fight. But what if you are the big guy? If you are the big guy, can you still be a cult brand? Wilt Chamberlain, one of the greatest NBA basketball players to ever play the game. The man scored 100 points in one game. For a season, he averaged over 50 points. And in that same season, he averaged nearly 26 rebounds a game. He also one year led the league in assists. For a 7'1 center to lead the league in assists is unheard of. But he only won two championships. The man dwarfed all of his competition. Nobody roots for Goliath, is what Wilt used to say, because whatever he did was never good enough. Whatever the biggest brands out there do, it's never good enough because people expect you to be great if you're a big brand. So what if you are a big brand? Can you get people to root for you? Yes, you can. Interit TurboTax has over 60% market share in the tax prep market, over 60%. They are the big dog. And they achieved the big dog status because they were out there trying to reduce fear, uncertainty, and doubt. They wanted to make their tax software so chimp simple, it would be easy for anybody to do their taxes. And that's just it. We never say, I'm gonna have fun with my taxes. No, we're saying, I gotta go do my taxes. They pioneered the Q&A format for getting your tax work done. And lo and behold, in the process, they became huge. They became the Goliath of the industry. However, in talking with Christine Morrison, who is a communications director there and has been there for quite a few years, we ended up learning that there was something driving into a TurboTax so much more these days. And it is an injustice 
that they are out there fighting. This big dog is fighting the injustice of people having to pay too much to get their taxes done. TurboTax realized that for most people, their income tax rebate check is the biggest paycheck of the year. What TurboTax also knows is that doing taxes isn't fun, as I said. It's doing taxes. So what they started pioneering a few years ago was holding tax parties. They piloted this program by having some of their employees have some of their friends and connections come over, about 10 people, 12 people, sitting at the kitchen table, all doing their taxes together using TurboTax. And in the process, Christine told us the story of how there was this Hispanic lady who was there. And she had had someone do her taxes for 10, 12 years. And this person who had done her taxes had passed away. So she was caught. She didn't know who was going to help. Lo and behold, she was able to go to a tax party and get help. And when this lady was done with her taxes, she says, okay, where's my $500? She went, okay, where's my $500? My taxes are done. Because what had been happening for the past 10 years was the person who was doing her taxes would automatically give her, okay, your taxes are filed. Here's your rebate, $500. The reality is, she was due thousands of dollars. Awful. The poorest people pay the most to get their taxes done. That is the injustice that TurboTax wants to fight. The poorest people having to pay the most. And so that is what is driving the Goliath of the industry, is realizing that what can they do to make sure that the people who are filling out their tax forms are not going to get cheated on. If you go to some of these tax shops, it is a rather expensive option. But TurboTax wants to make it chimp simple and to make sure that their customers get the most for the least amount of money possible. When I was at Starbucks, Howard Schultz would always ask us to do this. How can we as a company get big but stay small? And in this quote here, it goes to a Goliath wanting to become a David again. A company can grow big without losing the passion and personality that built it, but only if it's driven by values and by people, not by profits. When you think about Intuit TurboTax, being driven by people, being driven by this need, by this desire to fight the injustice of the poorest people paying the most, having that be the beacon internally to drive them to continue to be the Goliath, yet still personally connect with folks, makes them a cult brand. A couple of takeaways here at the time that we have left. Lesson number one, I want you to make aspirations actualizations. As you spend your time in this conference these next two days, think about this chart. It's called the aspiration gap. People aspire to live this way. Unfortunately, they live this way. In between is the aspiration gap. Everyone in this room has the opportunity to close that gap. And cult brands, they do just that. They close that gap. It's amazing that the companies and organizations that are going to be presented here doing this conference close the aspirational gap. It's November. What I love about them is they make it easy to go beyond checkbook charity. It is easy to write a check. It's a lot harder to put your time, your stash on the line. When you think about all the conversations that are sparked by people growing a mustache during the month of November, which is a family time for a lot of us, the questions that have to come up, the family photos that they'll have to answer for decades to. They are putting skin in the game, but November makes it easy for people to actualize their aspirations of doing something more than just writing a check for a charity. Airbnb closes the aspirational gap two ways. They close the aspirational gap from people that are wanting to earn extra income by renting out their place. And in the shared economy, it also allows those folks as customers who want to find a different hotel experience, something that gives them more authentic, richer experience. Closing the aspiration gap. 
but it also works for employees. Lululemon, as you will hear about today, and hopefully this will be touched upon, is how they close the aspirational gap, not just for customers wanting to live a healthier lifestyle, but for employees wanting to become better people. They set goals for every employee, and, the, and those employees are monitored and hopefully reached by those employees. And it's very difficult to become a Lululemon employee, just as it is difficult to become a Lululemon ambassador. But in the process, though, they close the aspirational gap of helping employees become better people. And really, that is, if we have a goal as cult brands, we need to make people better. Customers better, employees better. It's up to us to close that aspirational gap. Lesson number two, I want you to amplify what is right, not what is wrong. It's so easy to point out what's wrong in this world and broadcast that out as your message. Whole Foods doesn't do that. They never have and hopefully never will. Whole Foods, as you know, stands for natural organic foods. Anything free of anything fake. Anything free of anti, of, oh, of GMOs, of this, of that. If you go onto the website and you look really, really deep, they have an unacceptable list of ingredients. But that never goes into their marketing messaging. Their, their marketing messaging is all about how you can live a happier, healthier, and more flavorful life. The marketing messaging is also going into values matter. The messaging goes into what they are doing to teach farmers and ranchers how to raise their livestock in a more humane manner. John Mackey said this, we're in the business of selling whole foods, not holy foods. They're not gonna tell you exactly how to eat and they're not gonna demonize you for if you decide to go to a conventional store. They just want to show you the light, to show you a way, some ways to make it easier, yes, still expensive, but to make it easier to live a happier and healthier life. The third lesson is to see the dark or I should say, to see the light, you must first know the dark. For you to know what is right, you also must know what is wrong. Something that we like to do with our clients is an exercise that I would like for you to write down and think about over these next two days. I want you to think about your business, your brand, your cause, not as a business, a brand, or a cause, but as a superhero. I want you to think about it in terms of what a superhero does. Because a superhero possesses an exceptional power and does heroic deeds in a way that no one else can. And so there are a couple of questions that I want you to take a look at over these next two days in designing your superhero. Again, I want you to name your superhero. Name your brand, your organization as if it were a superhero. Give her a superpower. What, does the, what do you do that no one else can do? Who are you protecting? What injustice is out there? What are you trying to write that is wrong that's in the marketplace? Who are your arch villains? And what is your hero's kryptonite? What is the one thing that could take your business down? What is that one thing? What I'm basically talking about you doing here is a SWOT analysis, but done in a way that's more fun and done in a way that you might be even to take this back to your teams to say, hey, let's design our business, our brand, our cause, not as that, but as a superhero. And lo and behold, I think in there, you're going to find the light that helps you to minimize the dark. Me, I'm Stretch John Strong. Stretch John Strong, it's tough to say. That's my superhero name, my power, passion provider. I will never be the most polished speaker, but I guarantee you this, I will be one of the most passionate speakers that you will hopefully hear. I learned this back at Whole Foods I, when I was there on a job panel. I was there to interview. We had 13 people on this panel. These were all my coworkers and some higher-ups. What I ended up finding out was after that meeting, about six months after that, I had people come up to me and say, I have to tell you this. After that job interview, we all sat in this room and we realized, wait a minute, we want to get back to work. We want to take the passion that we just heard and apply it. My kryptonite would be familiarity. When I get to know someone, my guard is dropped and my stutter comes back big time. But I don't mind that 
because the person understands me and I understand the person. So I want to close by sharing a letter. This is a letter that I received a little while ago. It's a letter from Cheryl. She said, Dear John, I've wanted to write to you for a long time, but I wasn't sure how to start. There are things in life that stay with us, things that we do that if we could go back in time and erase, we would. One of mine involved you. In Mr. Dowdy's class one day, seventh grade, I heard someone trying to speak and stuttering. I made fun, not realizing it was you. When I turned around and I saw the hurt on your face, I felt horrible, but I wasn't mature enough to apologize. I've never forgotten what an ugly thing I did and how it hurt your feelings. I know it's been a long time since then, and you may not even remember, but I am so very sorry for hurting you that day. That letter touched me then as it touches me now. We have no idea the impact that we can make on people's lives. It might not happen today, it might not happen tomorrow, it might happen 10 years from now. But if we make this commitment to love, to fight, and fight to love, we're going to make a difference in people's lives. We're going to help people become better people. And in the process of helping people become better at being who they truly are and truly should be, our company, our cause, our organization becomes who we are and who we truly should be. I hope over these next two days you gain the inspiration, the information to participate in the fight game, to love, to fight, and to fight to love because the world needs more cult brands. Thank you.